Hey, hello! This is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration to help us in the process of getting students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I work at IE Business School Publishing, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Today, we have Dr. Zach Fitzwalter, and he is a gamification designer who uses game design techniques and principles to help help make tasks more engaging and motivating. So we, before we continue with your bio, Zach, are you prepared to mm-hmm. engage? I sure am. <laughs> so he's applied gamification to many different areas, including training, education, health, well-being, business, and HR. Zach leveled up his education in 2015 with a PhD in designing effective gamification for mobile applications. He has taught a range of university subjects over the last decade, including gamification, game design, and app development. He speaks at conferences in companies around the world and consults and develops game-like systems for industry, government, and research projects. He also runs an annual scavenger hunt and loves playing board games. So, Zach, is there anything else you'd like to mention that we didn't talk about in this intro? No, I think you covered it well. (laughs) Fantastic. So let's get a bit more personal into this interview. And we would like to know the first thing is, what's a regular day with Zach look like? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it starts with coffee pretty much every day. (laughs) Uh, But then it depends, really. So uh, I guess like a lot of consultants, um, or especially in this area, I may be working uh, with a client from their office or for a client from my office. I may be traveling for speaking or workshops, or I may just be writing uh, blog posts or uh, books at uh, our office. Wow. So yeah, it look, it really depends. Nice variety. Yeah, yeah, it's good fun. <laughs> That's true. So Zach, we want to shift now into a story. This podcast is all about stories. Our, our main section is about stories. And this mm. time we would like a story of what you would call perhaps your favorite failure or your favorite fail, as we as we called it in, in gamification Europe, that was Anne Coppins. First attempt in learning, uh, especially yes. a failure that perhaps set you for success or set you for a lot of learning and something that you could take a lot of learning from. So what's that story, Zach? Oh, so this is, I, I, first of all, I really like this question. I think uh, it's easy to hide failure and focus on success a lot, but I think we can learn so much from failure. And uh, video games do this really well. You know, you have to fail a lot of times, usually in some of the harder games, in order to, to just succeed. So uh, I really like this question. Probably uh, one of my earliest and biggest failures was when I took, uh, so well, I, I was researching um, gamification uh, and I was basically built an app for a research project and we decided that this app worked really well it was a gamified app um, to engage students at a university and we wanted to take it uh, and apply it to basically all the university Um, but taking a research an app built for research and applying it to the whole university uh, (laughs) two very different things and we had a very small development budget tiny and uh, we learned very quickly what uh you know, how difficult technically it can be and things, uh, we learned a lot lot about network load that day. Um, (laughs) And so we basically, you know, it didn't work as we wanted for the first couple of days just because of technical issues. And this is something that's really important to consider, uh, especially with a lot of gamified apps is just how they're going to work technically uh, as well as, you know, when you first come up with the idea. Um, so I think that was the biggest failure. We, you know, since then we now have apps used by thousands of people, recording tens of thousands of entries, and so we we all know all about infrastructure and load and things like that. But I think that was one of the biggest failures was just kind of building an app that can scale, uh, a gamified app that can scale. Take it. Take us to a bit more to that moment. Mm. What what was? I mean, what what failed? I mean, what what in your? Mm. It was not your design, obviously, because it was a bit more technical. But what's something yes. that perhaps you you realized and and that looking back you were perhaps do different right now? Well, uh, the first thing was panic. There's a lot of uh, <laughs> initial panic uh, once we worked out that it wasn't working as it should be. Um, and uh, look, it, yeah, it's it's interesting. I think it, just knowing. Having processes in place are really important. Knowing how to react to failure is really important as well. So, you know, we ended up pulling the app quite quickly and um, we fixed the code in it so we could get it back up there. Um, But just having processes in place uh, can be really important in terms of dealing with things. So that is thinking about everything that possibly could go wrong (laughs) and having, uh, having a strategy to deal with that. 
um, is probably the most important things. And it goes to show, you know, with a lot of larger companies now, you realize there is a lot of bureaucracy, but sometimes that's important to have in terms of, of making sure that things work because you're dealing with so many users in some cases. Yeah, absolutely. But there's one thing that I want to take from your story, just to make sure yes. that the, the engagers are are aware of this, that it's true that things can go wrong and that there's a large possibility of something to go wrong, but that should not stop you from trying, from attempting and from doing your first design and all these things, mainly because if you don't start, if you don't try, you'll never get it right. I mean, there's no way to get something right if you don't do it for the first time, for the second time, for the third time. And just like in video games that when you do, we try, try to play Mario for the first time, mm. you probably died in the first, you know, 30 seconds or less. That's the way that you learn the most. And unless you, you take that first step, you grab the controller in your hands and you say, you know, I'm going to try it. I'm probably going to fail, but then I'm going to learn from that and I'm going to move forward and I'm going to continue moving forward until I make it. And that's something that we can all learn from. And I'm sure that you learn many specific things from, from your project, but I'm sure that one of the main things that you learned was a bit of resilience, of knowing not everything will be perfect. It will never probably be, be perfect. So I had to do it anyway. And, you know, you have to iterate, perhaps. You have to change a few things. And on the go, you'll, you'll be able to do that. And it's never, that, that failure is never fatal, is it? I totally agree with you, Rob. Yeah, I think that's that's a, a good way to put it. And I love the Mario analogy as well, because I think that's spot on. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So now let's, uh, again, do a, a massive shift to go 180 degrees. Mm. And instead of going for, for the biggest fail or first attempt in learning, how about we talk about a great success, something that, that you faced, a challenge, a situation in which you said, well, you know what, I'm going to use game thinking, I'm going to use gamification to solve this engagement problem or this problem that we have. And run us through how, how that idea came to your mind and how you actually turn it into, into success. Yeah, sure thing. So um, ooh, it's a good one. I work on a range of different projects in different areas. Um, and one of the biggest challenges we're working on at the moment is road safety. So mm -hmm. that is how to make our roads safer. Um, and we're looking at how gamification can be used to encourage learner drivers to undertake more diverse practice while they're learning to drive. So it means they're better equipped when they get onto the road unsupervised. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's a real problem where uh, learner drivers, when they're supervised, um, you know, you're, you're okay. But as soon as you get behind the wheel by yourself after you've got your license, it can be one of the most dangerous periods uh, for, learner, uh, for drivers. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, so we're looking at how gamification can be used to encourage more diverse practice. But it's a very unique context um, because when you're learning to drive or when you're driving anyway, I don't know what the road laws are like over there, but pretty much everywhere you cannot use your mobile phone or technology while driving. <laughs> that makes sense, so, actually. <laughs> right. And so trying to add a game to that, you know, you don't want to distract people. You want to make sure that they are focusing on driving, but at the same time, then, you know, it's, it's an interesting design challenge. How can you design a game around that? Uh, and this started off as a research project as part of uh, the PhD that I was doing um, just after talking to other researchers uh, in different areas to see where gamification could be applied. But now we're actually, you know, actually taking those ideas and rolling them out into a real app. So, uh, you know, we've got an app that is officially recognized in one of the states in Australia here. Um, and that is being used by you know thousands of learner drivers, and so we're looking at how gamification can be used in that particular context. It's it's really interesting. And how do you integrate driving and, and, and using an app in your mobile? That's a that's a great question. So <laughs> because uh, that we, that was the first the first challenge yeah. that you mentioned. So I was I oh. have a cliffhanger here. <laughs> well, so we do a lot of automation. So we automatically capture a lot of different things. For example, the weather. Uh, we capture the time of day, we capture location, and we want to encourage diverse practice. So we're looking at once we capture that information, how can then we then represent that in interesting ways or how can we encourage learner drivers to then go practice somewhere different? So, you know, if they're driving mostly at day, how can they practice at nighttime? If they're practicing just on uh, the roads, the uh, local roads to school, how can we encourage them to go on the freeway when they're ready to, of course? And uh, if it's sunny, how can we practice, uh, encourage them to practice when it's raining? Um, so yeah, we look, we use a range of different techniques, um, different ones were used in my PhD and we're rolling them out slowly. We're taking a lot of influence from, uh, Duolingo, which is mm -hmm. one of my favorite gamified apps out there. I think the design is excellent. Um, but also just thinking about who, who is playing, who is using this particular 
app uh, and designing an experience that's unique for them. Hmm, fantastic. It, it brings two, <laughs> two things to my mind. I, I, there's an article by Ann Coppins in her, in her, mm. in her blog. Um, and she has a, a commercial of, they had like this challenge by an insurance company, I think, in which they were, they were asking a family if, if they asked you which of the drivers of this, this family is the safest or the best driver, mm -hmm. would, do you think it would be you? So they do this whole, you know, this whole <laughs> <laughs> live stuff and this, oh, no, it's me, it's you. But it's pretty much uh -huh. fun. And I'm sure you, you would uh, benefit from, from listening to that one and see, especially what they did with the, with the mobile solution. I, I'm not sure they, they specify it there too much, but it's perhaps something yes. you, can, you can use to study. And the other thing I, I, I remembered when I was when I was starting my driving career mm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. back in, 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 in Venezuela, which is where I'm from, I was yes. going to pick up my then girlfriend, now wife, and uh, it, it was raining before I left. So it was the road was tricky because it was not completely dry everywhere and not completely wet everywhere. So you didn't yeah. really know what to how to behave. But to be honest, and I was a very, very conscious driver. I was like an old lady driving most of the time. <laughs> My friends always made fun of me, and I, I don't, I don't mind. I, I didn't mind that at all. However, this time, uh, the thing is that in one of those curves, the 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 floor went from completely dry to completely mm. wet. So in yes. that curve, I had I went from the the, the fast channel to <laughs> to the to the other extreme. I I, I went through like. I think three lanes in that case, and it was yes. downhill. So I ended up looking uphill instead of downhill, which was where I was oh, going. No. It was, it was terrifying. But yeah. what I, I brought that up, especially because I had never been in a situation like that, and my first instinct, of course, when you're in a, com a complicated situation, was to hit the brakes, and that's the worst yeah, thing that you can do, absolutely yes. worst. So if I had yeah. been in a, in a similar situation without all that risk perhaps I would have been able to to react in a different way with your with your app that would have told me before, look, what you have to do in these situations is yeah. not hit the brake. You have to try to find somewhere to for the car to take off again and, and keep on on the on the correct road. And I was very to be honest, I was very lucky no no cars were passing by. So yeah. the, the whole thing was resolved amongst me and my insurance company. But oh, <laughs> but um, it could have been like very, very, very dangerous. It was downhill. Yeah, there was a precipice on terrifying. the other side. I mean, the, the, there many things could have gone seriously wrong. And mm. just learning and knowing what to do before would have been extremely useful. So please keep it up. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good, good to know how to react in those situations because yeah. it can be terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. Zach, is there when when you, you when you encounter a situation like this when you say, well, this is a problem that I think I want to solve using gamification. Do you have any process, any system that you follow to to get to a solution? Of course, every solution is different, but is there any path that you try to take when you when you want to create a gamified solution? Absolutely. So I guess this is uh, I have a gamification design framework that basically came out of my PhD. Um, and it, it follows a very specified path, uh, through, uh, how we can design, uh, gamification. Um, the, I think the thing with it in particular is really looking at the need for gamification in the first place. Um, so looking at what exactly the problem is, uh, and what are the goals that we're wishing to solve and then really validating how that problem exists, um, I think is really important. And also just to see what's been done before. So this, this gamification design uh, framework takes you through a number of steps, uh, looking at exploration and then designing for the particular players and then lots of play testing. Hmm. That's fantastic. Is there any anywhere we can, do you have any web page or anywhere that we can see a bit more details of your of your process? Totally. So you can read my 400 page thesis, but if you don't want, <laughs> if you don't want to do that, which I totally understand, you can jump onto my website. So gamificationgeek.com. Uh, and it's listed there. Uh, uh, there's a, a copy up there, um, as well as a lot of other learning materials. So that, that website is basically just a, a website to learn about gamification. Absolutely fantastic. I'm subscribed to your email list and I every once in a while I get one of your emails and I'm happy to <laughs> to take yeah, a look great. at what you got. Excellent. So Zach, now we're going to shift into the second part of this interview. And here we have more than the story. We have perhaps tools, perhaps ta tactics, or perhaps something, some quick things that happened in your life. What's your favorite game or that, that kind of stuff. And we're, we're going to get into those sure. details very soon. 
But the first thing that we would like to know is as a PhD, I'm sure you've bumped into many things and you've done a lot of research and there's many things you've taken a look at. So you are mm. one of the most qualified persons to answer this question, I'm sure. Is there I anything so. yeah. <laughs> that you think like most gamification projects could benefit from or what you could call a best practice? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I think uh, jumping to solution mode uh, is very easy to do when it comes to gamification because it's easy to get very excited about adding game elements uh, to you know, the particular problem you're working on. Um, but taking a step back and doing a lot of research, I guess this is something that comes from having a research background and then moving into industry, is that you kind of approach things still from a research perspective. So doing a lot of research beforehand, so talking to lots of people, understanding who you're going to be designing the gamification for and what exactly is the problem. Um, you know, a lot of the times you may look uh, or people may come to you and uh, clients may come and, and say, we want a gamification solution, but you kind of have to jump in and say, look, okay, this is great, but let's have a look at what exactly the problem is first. Often you may find that gamification is the best solution for something, especially when it comes to engagement or motivation problems. But other times you may find that it may just be a usability issue with a particular application they've got or a piece of technology. So it's really important to do that initial research. Once that's done, uh, they, once that's done, you can then jump into the, the fun part of designing the gamification. Um, and then once you've designed something, prototyping it very quickly is important and uh, lots of play testing <laughs> just to make sure that it works. So those, those, those two best practices are amazing. And it's something I have to mm. say, it's a recurring uh, topic that comes back into the podcast of really understanding what the problem is. And then yes. that way you can create any objectives you want to, you want to solve using your gamification design. And of course, yes. play testing is something that we've heard mentioned in many places and, and that I have to completely agree with you on that point. Mm -hmm. Zach, yeah. what's your favorite game? Oh, this is such a tough question. It changes <laughs> all the time, depending on many different things. But I'll give you my current favorite game. So my favorite game at the moment is Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I only got into this last year. Uh, I had a friend of mine who invited me along to a session. And it is uh, that's something that I've never really experienced before. It's very different to many other games I've played in the sense that, you know, you're sitting around a table. There's no real board or there's no real pieces to the game. You've just got your character sheet. And this game, it forces you to improvise and to act, uh, something that no other game has really done. Um, but it's great. It's got something for everyone. But it really took me out of my comfort zone uh, and uh, made me kind of think on the spot, which I really liked. So Dungeons and Dragons at the moment. Role playing games. Game. That's amazing. I, I listened to, um, I'm trying to remember the name of that podcast. I think it's Play, Game Play Learn or something like that. And they yeah. had an episode dedicated exclusively to some some of their recommendations on, on role playing games. Yes. So it, and of course yeah. to use them in learning. So so it was yeah, pretty interesting. Totally. Well, it can be applied very well to learning. Um, yeah, which is great. Absolutely. Zach, is there is there anybody that you would like to listen to interviewed in Professor Game? Mm, there are so many interesting people in this space. Um, one person that comes to mind is Jesse Shell. Uh, so Jesse Shell is, uh, he's based over in the States, a game designer. He is kind of his presentation originally at a conference called dice back in 2010 is what really inspired me to get into gamification. I think the presentation was called design outside the box. And he's also the author of the, the book, um, the, the art of game design, which is a great book. If you book ever want to learn anything. Absolutely. Yes. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever want to learn about game design, that is, it is one of my favorites. Um, otherwise, I know time zones can be rough, but there are some great Australian gamification designers out here. Uh, I know you've talked to Marigo already, yeah. Raftopolis. Um, but yeah, it's becoming more and more popular over here in Australia. And we've got some great gamification designers here that uh, could be interviewed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in, that same, in that same zone, is there any mm. book? What, what would be actually one book that you would recommend the engagers to, to read? Oh, good question. Uh, so I'm going to recommend the Dungeon Master's Guide. That is the D&D uh, the D&D book for Dungeon Masters. Uh, you can also get a copy of the D&D Player's Handbook. Um, it's, I know it's probably different, um, but just because looking at how you can use D&D 
uh, elements in everyday life or particularly in education is is fantastic. So I've got a friend who uh, she played D&D with us for the first time, I think one or two years ago, and she's a teacher. And now she's gone back and taken a lot of those elements and added it to her class in a very kind of basic format, but just to engage her students, which is great. Um, otherwise, there are some other fantastic books out there. Punished by Rewards uh, hmm. is excellent. I haven't heard of uh, that one. By Elfie Con. Uh, so it talks, I think the title is The Trouble with Gold Stars, Incentive Plans, A's, Praise, and Other Bribes. That's the full <laughs> one. So it's, uh, I think it's from the early 1990s, but it's one of the first books that really looked at, you know, kind of the issues when it comes to extrinsic motivation in education in the classroom. So, you know, giving gold stars and things like that. Um, and how that can affect intrinsic motivation. And I think it was inspiration for, I think, Dan Pink's Drive book, which is another excellent one. <laughs> um, and But yeah, it's, it's, it's a good book. It's, it's uh, definitely worthwhile checking out. Definitely. And in mm. that, once again, we continue with these, with these quick questions and, and these sure. tips. What is what you would consider your superpower when designing gamification? Oh, well, I, again, coming back to the PhD, uh, you know, having uh, five years as a researcher and lecturer at the university and then moving into industry, I could probably say having that research background may be a superpower. <laughs> so that is just, uh, you know, the great thing about research is being able to sit and read a lot of all the research and studies that have been done. And particularly in gamification, you know, there was very little research around 2010, but it has just grown exponentially since then. There are thousands of papers on gamification. So just knowing, you know, uh, that I've read many of those or a lot of those at least, um, and how the findings from that can be applied in real life to industry. Uh, I guess that's a superpower. Does that sound like, like a good one? Absolutely. Absolutely. Knowledge nice. is power and a lot of knowledge is definitely a superpower and all, all of that you've been able to absorb and to, and to take back into the industry and practice it. I'm sure it becomes quickly a superpower for you. You know, the 10,000 hour rule, I'm sure you spent a lot more than that. <laughs> well, probably more than that playing games. So maybe that's a superpower as well. <laughs> back when I was younger. <laughs> well, now, Zach, I know this is a question you've been looking forward to. It's time for our random question. It's oh, excellent. As I always say it's been curated, but it's going to be random mm -hmm. because we don't know what is going to come up. So sure. I'm going to click here and get okay, there you go. This is a professor. He says, I am a professor of entrepreneurship. He says, mm. I love to use the case studies in my classes, but I feel like there's a lot more I could do to get my students engaged and learn the, de the lessons deeply. Is gamification mm -hmm. something that could help me? How is that? Oh, okay. Interesting. So case studies, uh, it'd be great to hear more about what those case studies actually are. I'm guessing but... that that's the, the, the case study, me the methodology, the one, well, oh, the one yep, they, they right. use a lot in Harvard and in a few business schools. I'm guessing it's or something around that, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell for sure. If, right. it, if it, the no, question was for I, me, I would say it's, I, I would go for that one. Case studies. It sounds good. Yes. Well, look, it can be used in the classroom a lot. So, uh, you know, I taught um, or a, a university subject on gamification. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, look, using uh, th there's, there's a range of different uh, ways you can look at using gamification in the classroom. Um, so there's uh, an entrepreneurship professor in particular. Mm -hmm. What would you say is, is a way to, to engage the, the, the students, that, an audience like that one, people who are doing um, gathering professors? Yeah, I would say I might even delve in and say it's into business school. So, so this person is giving undergrads or, or, or MBAs uh, classes in entrepreneurship and he's teaching, I, I don't know. Let's say or one of the topics is how to deal with investors or topics like uh, the business plan and those kinds of things. Is, is there any way yeah. that you would say, well, this is this could be a, a nice tip for him to start implementing into gamification and to get into that world um, and and benefit the, the the class in that sense? Yeah. So I think uh, a great place to start would be looking at uh, what we could learn from Dungeons and Dragons, for example. So getting the students involved as much as possible would be excellent. Uh, seeing how role playing could come uh, into it as as a as a particular uh, activity, um, and yeah, basically looking at how you could get them up in front of the class, maybe role playing uh, some of the case studies or different things, and um, basically learning from them as well. Um, I think that's probably a good place to start. 
it's hard. My background is is in game design, yeah. teaching game design, as opposed to you know kind of the business area of things. But it can totally be applied in that area, in different ways. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So Zach, is there any final piece of advice that you would like to give to to the engagers before we say goodbye? Yeah. So I think um, when it comes to education in particular, it's good to start small uh, with the tools that you have. So. You know, a lot of the some of the great uh, gamification examples I've seen have just used PowerPoint, for example, or uh, free tools out there like Kahoot. Um, so I think if you're thinking about using gamification, particularly in the classroom, start small. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, using technology or computers. Uh, you can kind of use what you have on hand and go from there. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense because one of the, the big fears that many people might have, especially in, in, in the, the schools, in the high schools, that the budget is something that could be very... <laughs> very important yeah. to worry about is it oh, you know with that gamification thing and developing an app and all the technology yes. involved i don't yeah. know how to program so i have to hire somebody it could be a very big barrier but as you say there's many many ways in we can, in which this can be implemented and used without any any sort of technology and and i always use the example of in I, i saw in gamification world congress in 2016 mm. This nun, I mean, she was, an, you know, the image that we have of nuns is always, you know, this old lady who's oh, been yes. praying yes. for most of her life. And this was literally, I mean, you saw her and it was exactly that person, but they did a gamified, not only session and not only one classroom, but they did it for like half the school. So there's many, yeah. many things that you can use storytelling. There's, I mean, there's so many tools out there. And if, and if you do a little bit of research, there's incredible people doing great things around that that use absolutely no technology. So thank you totally. for that, Zach. Uh, is there uh, any way that we, can you tell us how we can connect with you or, or ask you for any advice, I don't know, on social media, whatever you, way you want for us to, to be able to contact you? Yeah, definitely. Jump onto my website, gamificationgeek.com. Uh, and you can find a whole bunch of resources and information there and you can contact me through the contact page. Fantastic, that's great. So thank you very much, Zach, for d uh, dedicating this time to the engagers and to this interview. And it's time to say it's game over. Thanks. Engagers, it's fantastic to have you around. And this podcast only makes sense with you. So let's let's connect on Twitter so you can let me know who would you like to have as a guest, um, any comments you can have about the podcast, or anything, any expectations you might have from Professor Game. My Twitter account is at Rob Alvarez B. Let's get the conversation started. I'm always sharing content on gamification, especially around education. Hey, hey, don't click continue yet. Do you know about Carl Cap? Yeah, that expert on gamification of education who mixes board games, card games, video games, who has all that jazz in a, in a few books around the topic. Well, next week he will be in Professor Game in an interview where with, we've gone a bit more in depth than our normal interviews and it's a bit longer, but I'm sure you'll get a lot of value out of it. So if that's something that you're interested in, then listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there. <laughs>